Hello and welcome everyone to the Northwest Quantum Nexus seminar series. I'm Sriram Krishnamurthy at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and I'm excited to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, James Whitfield, who will be giving us an interesting talk on Hatchery Talk and quantum technology. I'd like to start with two things. First, a disclaimer this seminar is being recorded. By attending this meeting, you may appear as an attendee in the recording. The questions and comments in the Q&A will also be part of the recording. Second, NQN and this seminar series have a code of conduct. conduct. NQN is dedicated to providing a respectful, friendly, professional experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, physical appearance, age, race or religion. We do not tolerate any behavior that is harassing or degrading to any individual in any form. Individuals are responsible for knowing and abiding by these standards. We encourage everyone to assist in creating a welcoming and safe environment. NQN reserves the right to refuse admittance to or remove any person from an event at any time at its discretion. With that, uh, let me introduce uh, the speaker. James Whitfield is a professor of physics at Dartmouth College and a pioneer in the application of quantum computing to quantum chemistry problems. He received a PhD in chemical physics from Harvard University. He serves on the scientific advisory board of Zapata and he's a co-founder and chief scientific advisor at Hubraid. With that, let me turn over, turn it over to uh, Professor Whitfield. Hi, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, you can see my screen as well. Let's see what's the best way to do this. Not yet. Nope. Yes, we can see your screen now, uh, but not in presentation mode. Yep, so now it's in presentation mode. Some, you guys are still with me? All right, excellent. Okay, so the title changed slightly. Um, uh -oh. Okay, well, I can't see you at all, but that's fair enough. Uh, we're all online, so I'll just give this presentation to the rest of the room here. And pretend you guys are in the audience. Uh, the title is slightly different than what I promised, but the idea will be exactly the same. We're thinking about doing Hartree Fock on quantum computers. Um, Hartree Fock using quantum resources, Hartree Fock with quantum technology. Um, let me note here at the very beginning, this is Hartree Fock as an optimization algorithm, not Hartree Fock as a time dependent method. Hartree Fock as a time dependent method actually has some uh, efficiencies using quantum resources. However, doing Hartree Fock and what I try and get across inside the, 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 um, the goal of this talk in many ways, the goal of the paper in many ways, is to highlight that Hartree Fock itself has fundamental limitations due to the structure of the problem. Hartree Fock is at the highest level an optimization problem. And when we use quantum resources to solve optimization problems, we still have an optimization problem. Optimization problems can be arbitrarily hard. And I'll try and give some sense of what I mean by hard, give some sense of what I mean by um, efficient, and some sense of what I mean by solving Hartree Fock. What is Hartree Fock? What are quantum resources? So I'm trying to go through all these things, unpack the entire title. Um, I, there's the archive reference there on the top. Um, this is done with Sahil Golania, who's at USC. He's going to graduate and actually start working in one of the national labs, um, I think in Chicago. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm very glad to be here. I, I've been in the Pacific Northwest before uh, visiting PNNL and Microsoft. It was a really nice visit. And so I guess visiting again virtually, but uh, you know, the way times are. Okay. So in getting started, let's just get a sense of what is the crux of the paper, right? So Twitterized version of that abstract for the paper um, is that this is the application of quantum technology to the Hartree Fock problem, it may serve as a hardware benchmark, but it's unlikely to have a dramatic impact on the practical approaches to this problem. By practical approaches, I mean that Hartree Fock has been done for over 100 years, um, or about 100 years. And during that course of that 100 years, we've used a lot of different ways of approaching Hartree Fock. 
Um, using quantum technology, at least in the way that is formulated inside the recent Google Science publication, um, just isn't going to give rise to a dramatic impact as far as the solvability of this algorithm goes. There may be some heuristic speed ups, but there's nothing that we can really say uh, definitively about quantum resources that's giving us any quantum advantage. So I'll try to get that across during the course of the paper, uh, during the course of this talk, and hopefully also help you understand, or at least appreciate, that some of the methods that people are advocating for inside of quantum technology, these methods aren't necessarily theoretically grounded in the sense that they should work asymptotically. They may work as heuristics, but it's not clear that these will solve any of these problems from particular complexity classes, which I'll introduce a bit later. Okay, so what I want to do for this talk, I have divided up into three parts. First, we'll give an overview where I'll talk a bit about my work that I won't talk about. I'll talk about some of the other things that are going on inside my group. Um, then I'll go from there to talk about optimization quite broadly, talk about some of the problems and computational aspects of optimization. And then we'll turn towards Hartree Fock, uh, give you some sense of what we've done, um, what's been done, and, uh, and what we're planning to go next. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, let me also state here at the very beginning that I welcome questions somehow doing virtual seminars and virtual classes, virtual all these things. I, like I miss the interaction. Just, just stop me, ask a question, just you know, give me a reason to just take a pause, okay? So I'll try to build in pause points so that we can ask questions and, and, and we can have a little bit of interactions and you don't have to be lost. I hate it when I go to a talk and I don't know what anyone's going, what's going on. So we have this roadmap here with the idea being if you get lost before we get to section two, when we hit section two, you can just check back in. And if you get lost after between two and three, check back in in section three. Okay, let's get started on our journey. Where I'd like to begin is just the motivation. Right. So why are we doing this? Right. So from my point of view, I'm coming from a background in chemistry and physics. So I'm thinking about how do we actually leverage quantum computing, quantum resources to understand molecules, solids, liquids, proteins, atoms, nuclei, fundamental particles, anything you ask for. And as you ask for different things, I'm going to require different amounts of resources. I'll require different amounts of of theory, I require different amounts of physics, different amounts of biology, different amounts of classical computing, different amounts of quantum computing. And so what I did here is just kind of drew um, a line of high interaction, low, low energy to high energy. So we talk about high energy physics, talk about low energy physics, proteins, cells, viruses. These aren't necessarily thought of as low energy, but from the perspective of the interactions, these are much lower energy than what you'd expect for say atoms um, that compose a protein. Um, at the smallest level, you're going to require the entire qu quantum theory is important, right? You can't do quantum, uh, you can't talk about fundamental particles without talking about quantum electrodynamics, field theory, and many other things. Um, and as we go to larger and larger systems, right, the poor correspondence principle gives us some intuition that there should be some transition from quantum to classical, right? We talk about a protein or molecular dynamics, we never use, um, we never use the full description a full quantum description. It's just usually not necessary. Sometimes you do things that will involve quantum informed, um, you know, some DFT, molecular dynamics, but in the end you're really doing it classically because that's the best way to describe the physics. Then um, you can include quantum reactions, but it's just overkill. And so there's a nice question of how do we actually transition between simulating fundamental particles to simulating proteins, viruses, and cells, and can we use quantum resources to go and approach these things even when it's not actually using quantum theory? So our motivation, from my point of view, is mostly in atoms and molecules, sometimes solids. We haven't done much with liquids in my group, and we really haven't done much with fundamental particles, although this interact, intersects with our work, um, as I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes. But we're really thinking about how to use quantum resources to improve the simulation of all these systems. And I'll even give a better definition of what I mean by simulation. Right now it's a very vague word, but I'll give some preciseness to it in a few minutes. First, I'd like to just say, um, you know, I work with about 10 people at Dartmouth. We have uh, four graduate students, uh, postdoc, a number of undergraduates are working with us. And so trying to make sure that we're doing something coherent means that we have to have a very clear picture of what we're trying to do. And what my work, a large part of my work and what I've been doing recently is really thinking about how do we know when we need quantum or classical, but not quantum or classical theory, but quantum or classical computation. I think this is a large part of what's driving a lot of the academic research into quantum computing. I think the uh, the uh, industrial uh, and the national labs and the efforts in quantum computing, there is no question. Like you work in the national lab, you have to do it. You work at uh, Google, well, you have to do it. Um, if you work in academia, it might not work. And that's okay too, right? There's no need to actually be convinced that it has to work, okay? Um, and on the right side, is a picture of uh, from Zurich's uh, very famous um, 
physics today about decoherence and measurement, where he's talking about this dividing line between quantum and classical. He's talking about when you need to use these different theories. Talking about the sun, for instance, is classical domain, photons, however, is a quantum domain, but this boundary is about theoretical theory, right? Now, I think quantum theory is pretty well accepted. The question is now about technology. When do we need to use technology on the classical side? When do you use technology on the quantum side? Um, if we want to use quantum technology to simulate atoms and molecules, we have to be able to simulate the atoms and molecules on quantum hardware. Quantum hardware is normally uh, dictated by qubits, as I assume, uh, hopefully, most of you guys have heard of qubits, quantum bits. These are two level systems. We have a state that's a zero, you have a state that's one, and these are uh, vectors, so you can take linear combinations of them. They need to be normalized, and hence you get a sphere. This is called the Bloch sphere. This Bloch sphere has a nice algebra. You get these poly matrices, X, Y, and Z. They give this SU2 representation. Um, and then this maps back over to fermions, where you have this very nice wedge product and all these different creation annihilation operators, a bunch of words that are, are not going to be super important for us today. But the point being is that there's a lot of structure that goes into this. Actually copying the fermion algebra to the spin algebra, and we've done quite a bit of work on this. Uh, one of my graduate students did a fantastic, uh, did a fantastic effort last year, um, early, pretty early in the quarantine. We have custom fermion codes. Could have given a whole talk about this, but let's not get derailed from our main line here. Um, I would like also to say that one of the other things we work on um, quite a bit is density functional theory. And this is, I think, a little bit too annoying for me not to do something about it. Uh, please pardon, pardon the interruption. Uh, drive me insane. All right. Oh, it still didn't work. Okay. What we'll do is just move this over. So. Um, time dependent density functional theory is this idea that if we have um, a, so this, uh, one second. Okay, hopefully you're still with me. Um, so the idea of time dependent density functional theory and the work that we've been doing in our group is thinking about how can we take um, uh, this idea of a quantum computer, which allows you to do quantum simulation, which we'll define in a few minutes, but it's basically allowing you to do time evolution. So now we can do time evolution of the, of the wave function and we can measure the density, the density being a cheaper variable to measure. This is just the one particle probability density. So it's a relatively small amount of information to measure up the quantum computer, which means you don't have to do large amounts of tomography. That uh, doing enough measurements of the density in time allows us to get the second derivative. This allows us to compute the forces on a classical computer with the correct density to reproduce the same potential as a non-interacting system. Okay, so we can make nice movies. We've done a lot of work here. Um, this is uh, something that is also a separate talk. But let me just say those are two things that are of interest in our group. Okay, oops. Right. So as I promised, when I say quantum simulation, quantum resources, what are we trying to do with the quantum computer? I'd like to highlight two important areas of just quantum theory. Two important areas of thinking about what is the point of having a Hamiltonian? Why do we even define Hamiltonians? What are we trying to do here? A Hamiltonian is uh, an operator, yes, but it's an operator that, that corresponds to two things. First, it corresponds to the energy and it corresponds to the time evolution. Um, the time evolution um, of this wave function is given by some unitary propagator that's dictated by this Hamiltonian. And the ground state of the Hamiltonian telling what's the lowest energy state is also going to be very important, especially in the context of quantum chemistry. The electronic ground state is going to be much lower in energy than um, than the first excited state, at least relative to the thermal energy that we normally discuss inside the room that you're in. However warm it is, most electrons are, most electrons around you will be in their ground state, uh, electronic state. Okay. Um, yes. So here's two examples of Hamiltonians. The first Hamiltonian would be the one that's more of interest to us. This has some um, kinetic energy operator, some one electron potential, and some two electron interaction or some two body interaction. Um, and then you have two spin interaction, and you have the sum over these different terms. And this is two different examples of Hamiltonians, and we can either solve the dynamics problem or we can solve the minimization problem. 
this entire talk is most about the minimization problem. This minimization problem is the one that we don't expect theoretically to get much speed up on. Um, and let me say, finding the minimum is an example of an optimization problem. Finding the dynamics is an example of propagating uh, a wave function in time. This is a bit different than trying to minimize anything or optimize anything. This is just trying to see how things change in time. So these are different approaches to the same question. In fact, you can use dynamics to approach minimization to some extent. Um, and minimization, if you did this for every single state and got out all the energies uh, for the Hamiltonian, you could do dynamics again. So these problems are very closely connected, but they're, I think, conceptually different enough that it's worthwhile to appreciate it. So let me just uh, leave that. And with that, that's our overview of what we're doing here. Now what I'd like to do is zoom in a little bit more. So we talk about optimization. So let me give a little more preciseness about optimization. What we're going to do now is define electronic structure. We're going to give some notions of electronic structure. We'll give some notions of the difficulty of electronic structure, which will then lead us into a discussion of some approximate methods of which hartree flock is one of the most important approximate methods for solving electronic structure problems. Okay. So first, what is electronic structure um, as a problem, right? as a computational problem? So we're thinking this is a computational problem. I think uh, many people um, who are thinking about electronic structure are thinking about, well, how did the orbitals of um, acetylene look like such that when another atom comes, how will the bonding pattern behave or um, you know, how tightly bound are these two electrons? These are all questions of electronic structure, but what do you need to solve computationally in order to answer those questions? You need to solve this problem, um, which I'm calling electronic structure. You're given some Hamiltonian with an external potential. The external potential is the only thing that changes from instant to instance. If you've heard of DFT, then you would really appreciate this. If you haven't heard of DFT, this is exactly what you're going to look at the first thing is that density functional theory works well because this external potential is the only thing that changes from instance to instance. We're also given a number of electrons. We give it some energy cutoff and an error parameter. This energy cutoff and the error parameter are to make it so that this problem is a decision problem. This will give us much more, um, many more tools theoretically to approach it as a minimum, as a, as a um, yes, no question because it'll put us into a complexity class that we can discuss alongside some other problems. Now, I didn't say much about this electronic structure problem, and this is a very unstructured version of electronic structure. Um, and in fact, it's not quite even electronic structure. This is just Hamiltonian minimization at some level. Um, for it to be electronic structure properly, we need to project to the anti-symmetric subspace. So that means that we're dealing only with the fermions. Um, typically, if we're going to do this in a computational method, we'll need to also project this into a finite basis. This is also going to introduce more errors. This will introduce um, this all, but it will also allow us to to actually do some computational methods. We could take m back to infinity, taking a complete set of functions, uh, say Laguerre polynomials or anything of that sort. Um, the electron spin is also not mentioned here. This is also very important. Um, but I, I won't say much more about it other than that electrons have spin. We have to include it. Um, it won't be particularly relevant when we discuss hartree flock however. And also the precision required. This is a very interesting point here. So there's one over poly n and this KBT. So KBT is the thermal energy in the room. So if we're talking electronic structure, we want to know which configuration is preferred over the other, then it's worthwhile to know this close to the thermal energy, um, or at least up to the, the accuracy of the thermal energy that you're going to be dealing with. And this one over poly n is really to allow this to be inside of complexity classes that, that we can define well. And we will not deal anything with uh, relativistic interactions. The electron, the electron nuclear coupling is completely fixed, um, which means that um, we will not allow the nuclei to move. We're only going to deal with electrons. And we also will discard magnetic interactions entirely, which includes spin orbital interaction. Okay. Right, so there's many variants of this problem. Um, the electronic structure problem that I'm most interested in as uh, someone who's been trained as a chemist and has been working in physics for a long time, we have this electronic structure with nuclear fields, which gives rise to both solids, um, gives rise to solids, to molecules, to atoms, and a large number of things that I find very interesting and things you can find inside the room, whatever room you're in, probably whatever your laptop's sitting on, whatever your laptop's made out of, all these things are gonna be very important just in terms of nuclei and electronic structure. So this is just saying that instead of having completely arbitrary potential, we now have a potential that has structure. Um, and the structure of that potential is given by some set of nuclei, nuclear charges. The ZAs are just integers, positive integers, and there's some um, some uh, some cost in, in them being closer or further apart. 
Uh, and then we can project into a finite basis. And this is what I mentioned already, that we can do this project into a finite basis. If you give me complete control over the finite basis, I can actually say some very interesting things about the computational complexity of this problem. However, the uh, problems, the last two problems that I've given you, I can't say much about it from um, what the complexity class is. And I haven't defined complexity classes, so don't worry. Um, there's two more electronic structure variants. So electronic structure variant, we have completely generic coefficients. So these coefficients, HIJ, HIKL, aren't from any integration of a potential and uh, some electron-electron interaction, but rather just numbers. It's fine, you can put numbers and you can still talk about a Hamiltonian instead of some anti-symmetric subspace. Um, and then you also have, uh, you could include magnetic fields if you wanted to. Okay. Now, we're coming closer to what we want to talk about here for hartree fock I think um, the, the another way to state what we had before was that we had a real space version of the Hamiltonian where we have x, y, x, and y representing uh, variables from R3n. So now we have n electrons and each one of these x and y's represent a coordinate of where it could be um, in space. And in fact, it should also have a spin variable included, but uh, we won't stress about that. Um, this anti-symmetric subspace can be enforced with these creation annihilation operators. Um, and these creation annihilation operators, we see this A sub I, A sub J in the dagger. These are operators, right? So every time you see an A with the subscript, you should think it's an operator and not just a scalar, which means that it has some matrix representation. It'll have some effect on a state to change from one state to another state. And, uh, these operators, however, have to satisfy an algebra. And these operators, if they satisfy this algebra, we can create states that are directly inside the anti-symmetric subspace, which means that they're already electronic wave functions. We have these single particle wave functions phi sub j, and this will correspond to the operator a sub j, and its permission conjugate a dagger sub j. And if we take an in-body wave function, we have n electrons, so we're going to have to have um, m in different variables that are non-zero, so k1 to km are the occupation numbers, each one zero, one. If we sum up all the occupation numbers, it tells us how many orbitals are occupied, and it also tells us how many electrons we have. So if we have n electrons, and this uh, k1 through km needs to add up to n, and there's some dk, which is some coefficient, and this r is the rank, the slater rank of this, of this, um, of this wave function. So we have this A1 through AM, and each one of these Ks will be different setting variables for how these Ks are configured from zero to one, uh, zero and one. And you can imagine these Ks are all from the subspace that has Hamming weight in, that would then uh, project you to the in-body weight functions. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So before I go any further, let me just pause and, and see if there are any questions on the definition of electronic structure before we say anything about the complexity of it. So James, there is a question. Uh, like uh, question. The question is, so you mentioned uh, in one of the slides defining the problem that typically one would project yes. the computation space, so the uh, electrons uh, space orientation into a finite basis. Uh, so can quantum resources help with the finite basis problem? I mean, let me say that in in principle, perhaps, but I think in practice, um, the way that people are approaching electronic structure on quantum computers currently, um, with the size of quantum computers, there's no real way to help with this basis set, right? On a classical computer, you know, you have gigabytes at your command, Okay, whether you can actually do anything and manipulate the data at that level is very difficult, but you can certainly load a database that has, you know, 100 orbitals, right, or 300 orbitals. But if you think I'm going to need one orbital goes with one qubit, I'm very limited in the number of, of basis functions I can put in. If I had quantum computers that had thousands or millions of qubits, or memory was much cheaper in the quantum setting, then it would be much easier to imagine having a larger finite basis. Now that said, uh, that said, um, uh, the question may have also may be interpreted a second way in thinking that perhaps we could get rid of the finite basis projection at all, altogether. Um, this is something that I, I've seen a few things mentioned in the literature, but I don't think there's any clear way to get rid of the uh, the electronic the electronic uh, to get rid of the discretization altogether. Uh, there's some methods for doing. Uh, things like integration on a quantum computer, which might let you get around picking a basis, but these things I think um, are, are far off and, and won't be realized inside the NISC era anytime soon. Uh, so does that hopefully that helps answer the question? Uh, that definitely helps. Uh, if I may ask a, a follow up before we continue, 
Yes. Uh, you on, on the latter comment you made. So we, uh, if we assume qubits are discrete, then uh, the number of qubits to the number of orbitals problem is there, right? So we cannot have arbitrary number of uh, uh, orbitals represented with a finite number of discrete qubits. Yes. But if we think about the quantum computer as an analog device instead of a discrete device with just two states, uh, does that help in any way or even there we are stuck? No, I think in the quantum computer as an analog device actually leads you into a whole host of other problems that have to do with scalability. If you use analog computing, I think analog computing in theory can work, but you need infinite precision. Um, there's some real complications if you start using analog computing. Digital computing works very well because you have a very well-defined two-state system. You have a zero or you have a one, there's nothing in between, so a lot of these fuzzy things can kind of get washed out and a lot of error correction is much easier with digital technology. So with quantum computers, if you're going to use an analog device, you're going to have a lot of trouble doing error correction, and that's exactly where people are looking at now. Um, I think you can do a lot of things analog now inside this NISC era that you probably won't be able to do when you go to larger system sizes. So. Um, I was thinking more that if you take the qubits, um, you think of the size of your Hilbert space, you could use this to actually discretize the integral domain um, sufficiently accurate that you would get back, uh, you know, precise integra in integrals, um, quadrature methods and such. Okay. So Thank you. Everyone good for the moment? Let's yes, continue. we do not have any further questions at this point. Yeah. Great. So now we're going to talk about computational complexity. Computational complexity is a very interesting topic to me. Um, it's also a very uh, interesting topic for a lot of reasons that we're trying to come up with theoretical arguments about what the worst case thing could happen from trying to solve some type of algorithm. Um, and these complexity classes have a lot of funny names um, and some of them uh, make a lot of sense. Some of them you have to unpack a bit. This is Merlin authors, non-deterministic polynomial time, and these are all classes that require someone with more power than you to give you a hit. The other side, you have a verifier um, this verifier can just run a regular computation. You know, you do step one. If step one gives you a three, do step five. And if step one gives you a, a four, do step three, and you have some flow chart of how you're going to go through this. That's deterministic. Now, if you're going through this flow chart of some of some algorithm, but at every time you you know, if you step one and you flip a dice and it comes up uh, an even number, then go to step seven. If it comes up an odd number, then go to step eight. So you have some access to probabilistic um, resources. And this BQP is bounded error quantum polynomial time. This is bounded error polynomial time and polynomial time. That's what the P stands for. Um, this entire idea of complexity classes is really determined by um, the scaling as a function of the size of the input. So as the input doubles or triples or quadruples, how long does it take to solve the problem? And the doubled, the quadrupled, or the tripled input size, how does that scale with the input size? Um, so let me say a little bit more about this idea of, of non-deterministic versus deterministic. So deterministic and non-deterministic, I think the way I like to think of these two notions is thinking of um, if I'm an expert, let's say I'm a student, I'm on this side, I'm on a student, and I want to know the answer to how to do uh, some basic problem kinematics. I don't know how it works. And the professor says that the answer is three. OK, now for this entire game to work, it's not good enough for the professor just to say the answer is three. They have to give you a hint that you can sufficiently understand to figure out that the answer is indeed three, right? They may have a hint that there's no way you could have gotten as a student because they've been doing it for hundreds of years, or not hundreds of years, but doing it for 30 years or doing it for 20 years that they've just seen all these problems. They know the trick already. And they tell the student what the trick is. Now the student can solve the problem very quickly. And that's the idea of all these different methods. So in this Merlin author, Merlin's going to give author a proof, and author's going to be able to use the probabilistic methods to check whether Merlin gave him a correct proof or rejected if Merlin didn't give him a correct proof. Um, so I got a couple examples here. So just in terms of this deterministic and non-deterministic problem with time. So if uh, the example is, is that Alan Turing, this is a picture of Alan Turing, very important scientist. Um, I don't want to get too derailed here. And now, if you've heard of a phone book, I, this is <laughs> a bit anachronistic, just given that we're doing everything online now. <laughs> like, I don't know what a phone book is. But in any case, if you had a phone book, if you remember what a phone book is, it's a book that has numbers and names. Okay, And the names are normally in alphabetical order, as you can see inside this picture. These are all the A's, and you see there's some B's, and then 
so on and so forth. So all these names are in alphabetical order. But if you give me, if you ask me what Alan Turing's number is, then I can find it very easily because I have his name. I just look through the database for the T section, find him. Okay, got him. Here's the number. On the other hand, non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm is who has this particular phone number? Now, there's no way that you can use this phone book easily. There's no deterministic way to use a phone book to find it. Now, you can flip it open to the random page and say, oh, here's the number I'm looking for, but that's not a, term, a deterministic procedure. And so in the case of Merlin Author or any of these non-deterministic um, games, someone's going to give you a hint. So say, instead of giving you the full name, I'm going to say L.A. Whitfield, okay? Well, you go look it up and you just go to the W section, you find the Whitfield section, you say, oh, uh, Lily, okay, great, I see. That's that's the name we're looking for. And you say, oh, there's a phone number that, that this person has. Now, if Merlin gives this hint to author, it's very easy for author to check that Merlin's giving him a correct answer. Now, if he goes to the phone book and checks his entire W section, says there's no, there's no one with this phone number, then he doesn't have to, then Merlin loses the game, as it were, and loses his, his payout, whatever might be the case. Um, okay, so that's my introduction to non-deterministic polynomial time classes, um, non-deterministic quantum classes, and the whole idea of the quantum Merlin author is that now Merlin can give a quantum state, so instead of this being a, a string, it can be a quantum descriptor that Merlin would have, that author would have access to. Once he gets this quantum state, he can use a quantum processor to, to analyze the state to answer whatever question he initially had. Okay. So we're going to ignore the top two lines. I think that's too much to walk through in the amount of time that we're at. Um, but I do want to walk through this VQE implementation. This is variational quantum eigensolver. It's in red. HF stands for Hartree Fock. The rest is just alphabet soup in many ways. These are different ways of doing quantum optimization, different ways of doing classical optimization. Um, and the two in red are the ones that we really want to pay attention to. This Hartree-Fock, we'll, we'll discuss a bit later, but let, first let's take a second for this variational quantum eigensolver. The variational quantum eigensolver is that you have some Hamiltonian and you're trying to find the minimum of this Ham Hamiltonian uh, or some operator that, that's serving as a Hamiltonian. And there's some parameters that are parameterizing your wave function. So you have some wave function here with some thetas and some ways of parameterizing this wave function, whatever that might be. You parameterize the wave function, then you evaluate the energy on the quantum processor. And then you check and see how that changed your objective, update the parameters, measure, check, repeat the cycle. This is an optimization task. And optimization tasks are known to be difficult. Optimization tasks are known to be NP-hard. Um, and the fact that we have an NP-hard task alone means that this is going to be a difficult problem um, in the worst case. Now, however, worst case does not mean that things don't work. So I'm not trying to say that you can't make progress, even if the worst case is terrible, right? The average case may be very easy. So don't think the worst case is the only thing characterizing these problems. However, it's saying that we don't expect this will work in all instances. Okay. Um, and as I was just saying, the state preparation idea belongs to class quantum Merlin author. We can see that because if someone gave us a quantum state, then they prepared it, right? Someone prepared this quantum state. In order to prepare the quantum state, you need to be as powerful as Merlin himself in order to play this game, which means that you're going to be much, much more powerful than author because you can answer any question any other author could ask you, um, which I hope makes sense. Um, and there's this QCMA. Uh, I will not say anything about that. Anything about that either. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, as an academic, one of the things that I find most interesting is that I can ask questions that are a little uncomfortable for the entire quantum community, right? So we're talking about um, BQP algorithms to solve instances of electronic structure, right? So electronic structure, if we're talking about this as an optimization problem, we're talking about the ground state. We're asking how difficult is it to find the ground state? Um, and finding that ground state may be very, very, very difficult. Um, but if it's very, very, very difficult, it's also going to be difficult for a quantum computer, right? So that means that there's no BQP, no bounded error quantum polynomial time algorithm, no efficient quantum algorithm that would solve every instance of electronic structure either. However, if there's an algorithm to solve one instance of an electronic structure problem, is there also an algorithm that can solve it, a classical algorithm that can solve the same instance? That's a question that I don't really know how to uh, prove, but I think Constructing counterexamples would be extremely interesting for someone to actually sit down, think of an example where you have a, a bounded error, an algorithm that can solve the ground state problem quantumly, uh, whether you can promise that there's no classical way to get the same solution. Note that all of the quantum supremacy protocols are using B 
B2P problems rather than QMA hard approximations. They're not trying to find ground states. It's normally doing some propagation in time, something that generates a large amount of entanglement, and then trying to ask some statistical question about sampling from it. Um, yes. And yes, and so these are questions that are, that are driving my research. But let me say I don't have answers to these questions. Just leave them as open conjectures. If you have some ideas, please tap me on the shoulder afterwards and we can talk about it then. OK, so I'm about halfway through my talk. Um, and we're about halfway through the hour, so right on pace. Um, now, with the remainder of the talk, what we're going to get into now is just hartree fock theory. Then we'll talk about hartree fock and quantum computers, talk about limitations of hartree fock and quantum computers, and what we want to do with all this information that we've gathered um, in the last uh, few months. Okay. So first thing up first, let's explain what hartree fock is. So let's do a little bit of background on hartree theory. Hartree theory, I like explaining it in this very nice way. I think it's, I don't know how my camera looks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a while since I've been able to give this uh, in, a, in a fun way. Um, but yeah, so the um, hartree fock algorithm, and there's a, a violin there. I like telling this story to explain hartree fock because it took me a long time to think of this, and I think it's a very intuitive way of understanding hartree fock And if you imagine a bunch of musicians need to tune up their instruments before the orchestra begins. So normally you go to a concert and you hear, everyone's tuning and then the silence and then the music starts after the conductor begins now in order to tune you can imagine that's an interacting problem everyone can hear everyone i can hear all the other instruments around me which means i have some interaction between the different musicians now imagine i wanted a non-interacting music set for whatever reason okay i want these things not to interact so what i'm going to do is take each musician i'm going to give them their own studio booth and one booth here, one booth here, one booth here. Imagine it's quarantine. They can't be in the same room. It's terrible for everybody. And they still want to tune up. So one of the ways you can make a mean field approximation for tuning up is to start with, um, yeah, to start with um, new orbitals. So these new orbitals you can imagine um, as being the separate. So you imagine the orbitals as rooms that the electron could be in, and, or the musician could be in. So each one of these booths is where the the musician is, is at. Musician has his instrument, and that instrument will be tuned to a particular frequency. And you should think of these frequencies as energies. And what they're going to do is play their individual frequency, and then everyone inside the, all the other booths are going to play their individual frequencies, but they don't hear each other. No. What happens is in their booth, the note gets recorded, and then a central computer averages that note and then plays it back to all the booths. Plays it back to all the booths, then everyone hears their note and says, Oh, I was a little high off the average, I was a little low off the average, and they tune up or down accordingly. And then they play their note again, gets recorded off of all the rooms, and then once it's recorded from all the rooms, then um, you, you take the average note again, and that's you know generating the new field. Um, and then these old orbitals, everyone tunes up, so they get some new orbitals with the old field. And then once they've all tuned up, they play their note, that gives a new field, and then that's going to that's going to generate the new field with the old orbitals. And then you repeat repeat, repeat, repeat until the whole thing becomes self-consistent. That everyone's playing at least the same note. It might not be exactly A, but it'll be close. Right? And that's the idea of, of an approximation, that it should be close. Now, you could also imagine that someone uh, has really fat fingers or maybe very really clumsy or it's a really tricky instrument, that every time they play the note, they overtune or they undertune and they overtune and they undertune, they overtune, undertune, and then it never converges, right? You can imagine someone just being a very bad musician or very bad with their instrument that they doesn't quite reach the point they're supposed to. And that's exactly what can happen inside of Hartree Fock. Okay. So now into some more technical details to kind of unpack what we're looking at here. Hartree Fock gives a rise to these molecular orbitals. These molecular orbitals you see on the left, the same thing for density functional theory. Density functional theory and Hartree Fock are almost the same method but very different fundamental underpinnings, um, with hartree fock actually being a subcase of density functional theory. Um, nonetheless, in both instances, what they give back as part of the output, uh, and what you should think of these orbitals, are actually something like this. Each one of these is a picture of orbitals um, for, for a molecule, and these orbitals um, are just single particle functions, right? So some phi of r, just one coordinate. And this is where one electron could be, and actually two electrons if we take spin, spin up, spin down, everything's fine. Um, nonetheless, this is the orbitals that they've been converged. Okay. And we're using phi here on the slide to represent the orbitals, and this sum over the different orbitals times some matrix and give rise to the density. Uh, and that's actually called the charge density. So let me 
put forward. This is called the charge density, um, and we're actually going to need this charge density matrix, which will give rise to the actual one body density. And then we're going to compute is some functional. So this functional here is effectively what I just described verbally. That you have some way of computing the average, and this average that you're computing is going to be this this uh, mean field, this g here, and the orbitals are going to be the eigenfunctions of this operator. Okay. We get to more technical descriptions. Now in Hartree-Fock and density functional theory, I mentioned these two are very close in in, in spirit and in practice. Um, in Hartree-Fock, this mean field. Um, this G object, which is going to represent your average interaction, the same thing as all the averaging of the musicians playing their instrument um, at one particular frequency or closely uh, close to the same frequency. Then you're going to get this mean field in one way, adding up these two terms, which are defined below. Uh, for density functional theory, you'll get it by adding up the Coulomb, but then instead of using the same hartree fock term, you have a different term that comes from um, that comes from a Merlin, actually, so it's actually very difficult to actually write down what this boldface EXC, this exchange correlation functional is. So this is actually where they differ slightly, but you make an approximation of exchange correlation functional, and then you get back this potential, and then you just play the same game, and the, the convergence is still the same, because it still depends on its eigenfunctions. Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, any questions here? It says the... It's a high level description. Uh, I don't believe we have any additional questions at this point, but thank you for the uh, wonderful description of uh, the intuition behind Hachi Fuck. Yeah, well, we're going to continue a little bit more. Uh, we're going to make sure these things are crystal clear as possible. Um, we're going to give a couple different formulations that hopefully kind of submit what we're doing here. And so hopefully help understand why this problem is not sped up by quantum resources, at least not in the formulation that we have now. So for Hartree Fock, we can, we can restate the entire problem, the same exact problem that I just described to you, these musicians playing in their separate booths from the in-body picture, from the actually taking the full wave function. Um, taking the full wave function, however, to make the Hartree Fock approximation over the full wave function, what we actually do is say that we're going to take rank one states. So I described these uh, anti-symmetric orbitals. We're going to have you know, these orbitals that occupied, some product of uh, occupied orbitals acting on some vacuum state, and I'm going to sum over all the different possibilities. But now instead of summing over the possibilities, I'm only going to take one state, one in-body state. I'm not going to change that in-body state at all. However, I'm going to allow the local orbitals to rotate. I'm going to allow each local orbital, so this is the orbitals represented by AJ, which will correspond to these phi's, and then I'm going to rotate these with some linear combination, some unitary combination, which will then give rise to some other linear combination. Fine. And then I'm going to have just one single Fox state, but with whatever linear combinations I please. Okay, so I can do a local rotation of the local orbitals, local orbitals meaning that's one electron states, to keep a fixed in-body state, or a restricted in-body state. And with that restricted in-body state, if I find the minimum over that restricted set of states, that is the hartree fock energy. Because it's the second way of specifying this problem altogether. So no, no circular anything, no convergence, just find the minimum. I don't care how you do it. Okay. Um, right. So I mentioned that there's a number of things that, uh, that we discussed in this, this, this Coulomb and exchange term. So you can see how these arise quite naturally from this formulation. Um, so we start off with this, this, uh, this AIJ, AJ. You can see that these operators themselves, right? So when I plug in this uh, WJI, well, I'm going to pull out a W uh, from this term, and a W dagger from this term, get a W, W, W dagger, W dagger, W, W. And so you see that I have four um, instances of W here. I have two instances of W. And what you can see is these two instances of W can be combined cleverly. And this N1 is projected onto the occupied states. Um, and so you're just rotating the occupied states. So again, as I mentioned, just rotating the orbitals that are occupied. Um, and that just gives rise to the same exact state. So this W shows up here just from rotating these two, and that gives us this W here. You have the same operator PQ, but just different indices. Here you're gonna get the same notion. Um, we end up with two terms just because of the anti-symmetric nature of fermions. Um, but you can actually plug in this expression here into this one, and you actually get back this, this this quite nicely. It's actually a very nice exercise if you haven't done hartree fock before. And this is the Coulomb and exchange terms that I mentioned already, and you can compute these pretty much by hand without too too much trouble. Um, you have to be a little more patient than I'm, I am during the middle of the talk, but nonetheless. Okay. 
So, all right. This formulation that I have so far, okay, the whole reason that I went through this to kind of say that this EHF comes down to this formula in terms of these P matrices. So what you can see here is that this EHF is actually a functional of what you choose for P. As you change different choices for P, different choices for W, then it's basically rotating over different options for the basis rotation. Um, so the way that I'd like you to think about this is that you have a functional, right? So this is something that's going to take in a matrix um, this charge density matrix is P. It's going to get back an energy, right? This G SCF is going to depend on, on P nonetheless, but we can still plug it in and we can plug in a P here as well, but it's still just a functional of P. So you give me a P, I can compute an energy with it under the Hardy-Fock approximation. Um, and this P comes again from the charge density matrix. Um, there's convenient parameterization. So I mentioned that this is just a rotation of the local basis. A rotating local basis, if you don't change uh, the, the occupancy of which orbitals you're, there's some symmetries there of the way that we've defined these Fox states. And if we're just rotating amongst the orbitals that are all occupied, it does nothing. Rotate amongst all the orbitals that are all unoccupied, it also does nothing. So we actually need to only include rotations that couple these two blocks. So you have this projector. So P itself is a projector. So we have projection into the occupied space and some coupling and then projection into the unoccupied space. Same thing here, unoccupied space to the some, some coupling to the um, occupied space. And this X needs to be anti, anti uh, yeah, anti-symmetric, I think is a reasonable way to describe this. And the symmetric such you get back um, a nice transformation, a nice unitary transformation. And yeah, this is just the way of describing exactly how that works, right? So we have this block diagonal matrix. Right? Okay. So this is how we parameterize entire functionals. Um, okay, I think it says the same thing. Yes, okay. This also says the same thing. Uh, yeah, well, I can go through this one briefly. Um, so yes, the Hartree-Fock problem is just minimizing over these different um, possible rotations for the orbitals. But when you finally find the minimum over all these orbitals, these are called the molecular orbitals, typically. Um, and the input orbitals are called the atomic orbitals. So this is just a little bit of terminology, um, because why not? Okay. Uh, so the entire uh, impetus for writing the paper that we wrote was that we read this paper by the Google team, um, which was hard to fuck on a superinducting qubit uh, quantum computer. Uh, I was really excited when I heard about this result. I was extremely excited because I had thought about how to do hard fuck on a quantum computer for some time before this. I didn't think about hard fuck for many, many years. I think it was the first thing I learned when I started, maybe not the first, first thing I learned out of quantum chemistry. Um, and in this context, right, I was really excited to see what they had done, to find out what sort of ideas they had, to see how they'd actually built up a, a method for doing Hartree Falcon on a quantum computer. Because when I tried, I was like, well, I don't see how you can improve this. It turns out that they tried and they also didn't see how you can improve it, or at least they didn't publish inside the first publication that they have. Um, what they did inside this paper was uh, effectively um, test out their quantum device. They tested out their quantum device. That's what they really did, right? There's nothing wrong with what they did. The experiment they did was quite nice. Did a lot of error mitigation techniques, did a lot of very intelligent things to figure out how to actually implement the gates onto a quantum computer, how to actually deal with noise. Um, and they actually did a very nice job of benchmarking the device that they were using. However, the algorithm itself is an optimization algorithm, and there's nothing about the strategy that they used that was particularly compelling in terms of solving hartree fock more efficiently than you could with the classical computer. Um, okay, excuse the handwriting, but nonetheless, the main idea of what, what's happening since this Google paper, so you have some parameterized circuit with these thetas, you know, as we discussed in this VQE implementation, so very much a VQE inspired uh, methodology. So you have these different values for theta, these different values for theta show up inside of some charge density matrix, and they show up inside of unitary, which is rotating the initial charge density matrix. This new uh, parameterized P gets plugged into the energy functional and gives back your variational um, quantum, quantum eigen energy, right? So just vary over these values for theta, do the measurements, estimate what the energies are, and you're good, right? This is what the paper says. However, the paper says nothing about the speed up you get over classical methods. Um, and I think that was done because they don't have anything that speeds up of classical methods. And what I want to highlight here is some of the things that happen, some of the ways that we kind of want to tease this out and highlight that fact. Uh, yeah, let's skip that. Yes, so um, the reason that we don't expect this to work is that Hartree Fock itself um, is an MP complete problem. So, MP complete means non deterministic polynomial time. Um, and so, if we think of 
what we discussed earlier in terms of computational complexity, the fact that you have polynomial time is not a deterministic polynomial time where you have some uh, Merlin and you have some author. Author has his resources, but he needs a hint from Merlin to solve the problem. You know, just as in the phone book case, you give me a hint, at least what's the last name. Okay, I can make some progress. Um, polynomial time, part of this problem, is evaluating the functional. Right? So this functional is very easy to evaluate. Okay, not super easy, but not super hard. This is an M by M matrix. This is a couple matrix multiplications, a few additions. Take a trace. Okay, I get back an energy. Not too bad. However, varying over all possible charge density matrices is a much more difficult task, and that's where it becomes non deterministic, right? So, how do I actually find the minimum of this functional? So, I can evaluate the functional many times, but that won't mean that I find the minimum over all possible charge density matrices. However, if Merlin's nice enough to give us a charge density matrix, well, then author can check it quickly because he can evaluate the functional for charge density matrix P. Um, there's a proof that goes back to uh, um, Norbert Schuh and Frank Ristrade back in 2009. Um, they also have some really nice papers about density functional theory that I'm not going to mention, just in the interest of time. Um, nonetheless, the idea is that Hartree-Fock itself is NP-complete, right? Depending on what parameters you pick to actually describe the system. Um, and this is, again, in the setting where you have completely arbitrary control over the intervals, not necessarily from a nuclear problem. Okay, now, uh, as I said, I've been thinking about this for a long time. So back in 2012, I started thinking about computational complexity and electronic structure. Um, back in 2014, we were thinking about a Hartree-Fock method for translation of variant systems. And then last July is this paper where we think about limitations of Hartree-Fock with quantum resources, right? Um, so this is just a little bit of my course through thinking over the past X number of years. Um, I returned back to Hartree Fock with quantum resources after reading the Google paper because I thought it was interesting that they had commented at all the computational complexity of the problem. Yes, so what we did inside of this paper to kind of illustrate the problem, and this is where we want to go um, in the future, is really looking at these Hartree Fock energy surfaces, which are called HES. Um, these HESs are just basically parameterizations of all possible charge density matrices. In this picture, you have some hydrogen, hydrogen, um, some H2 molecule. And we're just stretching the H2 molecule inside this axis. Well, this is this stretching this way. It's getting longer as you go towards the bottom. And this value of theta here is representing the rotation over the possible charge density matrices. So we're trying to find the minimum energy as you rotate to rotate through the different charge density matrices. I'll unpack that a bit more in a few minutes, but let me say first, this is uh, we're using only a minimal basis, SDO3G, this is Slater type orbitals, three Gaussians. Uh, we use pi SCF and open fermion dash circ routines. Circ spelled correctly, fermion should have an IO. We modify the initial states and we modify the molecular instances. So looking at these last two parts is really how we could illustrate a clear failure of their algorithm and even illustrate how quickly it fails, how well it performs. Uh, before we do that, first let us think about what the previous plot had. The previous plot was uh, a static version of the plot you're looking at here. Okay, this is the static version. This is inter-nuclear separation, and we're looking at this value of theta across here. Now you're seeing the same exact plot, except now we have theta on the bottom, and what you're seeing is now R changing. What I think is interesting about this is that if we look at this, we can see the number of minima in this in, in this. Uh, the number of minima and maxima changes as you change the bond length. So this actually says that there's some interesting things happening. So you can't characterize excited states. You're not getting back enough critical points to even characterize excited states at all values for um, for the bond distance. So it's actually quite interesting to think about how do we actually generalize Hartree-Fock beyond just ground states, excited states, and some very interesting papers that came out last year um, that we're looking at now. Now, what we did to compare against the Google papers, we took their code. Um, in their code, what they used was they took basically the, the converged Hartree-Fox solution and then perturbed it very, very slightly, one-tenth of uh, one tenth of the unit, right? I don't, know, I don't know what these units are. I don't know how to describe the units yet. But this lambda that they used inside of their implementation was 0 0.01, so it's very minimal uh, perturbation. We tried taking the larger perturbation, which we multiply by 10, and multiply by 10, it still converges. Multiply by 12, it doesn't converge. You get caught in a local minimum. Similarly, if we think about this one, um, again, starting from 0.1 and multiply by 10, converges to the wrong minimum. You have to keep lowering this value until you get some convergence, right? So you see at 0.3, it converges very quickly. 0.6, it converges slower. And then above that, it starts not converging. So this is 
just a very simple illustration of non-convergence in Hartree Fock. I think um, anyone who's done enough Hartree Fock can find more examples, can find examples in the wild, has seen instances where it doesn't converge. There's a lot of methods inside of Hartree Fock for dealing with failed convergence. So convergence in Hartree Fock is not a new issue. The point is this heart, the, the method that's used for the quantum um, Hartree Fock method is still the same minimization method you'd encounter on a quantum on a classical computer. So there's not really any chance for a speed up. Uh, Yes. So what I want to say about our future work, so that's about where the paper ends. We just kind of made a comment there. Now what we want to do next is think about how we can actually do landscape analysis and algorithm selection. So I think this is really exciting. So if you're checking with me in a year, even maybe less, maybe six months, we'll be able to answer this question much better rather than just having pictures of landscapes. We'll be able to use characterizations of the landscape. So each problem F here would be a particular landscape from Hartree Fock. And then you have a characteristic space. So we're going to map each one of these uh, surfaces. So we look at these surfaces. They have some ripples. Maybe it has many minima. Maybe it has a few minima. Maybe it's smooth. Maybe it has uh, multi multimodal. It's a lot of different ways to characterize um, a landscape. And then with all these characterizations of the landscape, we use a neural network. We will use a neural network to then evaluate how well an algorithm. So Hartree Fox default solver, Hartree Fox with, um, you know, uh, uh, Fractional probabilities, Hartree Fock with VQE, Hartree Fock with UCC, Hartree Fock with whatever parameterization you want. And then the idea is we'll go from there to performance space and then try and see if we can use these characteristic methods, take characteristic space, and actually see when a neural network, an unbiased neural network, would select a quantum algorithm, would select a classical algorithm. So it gives a very clear instance of when you'd want to use VQE and when you want to use a particular format for, um, for Hartree Fock. So that's um, where our future work is, and just to kind of draw some conclusions. So the examples we chose in this paper were just H2, and we chose H3+, plus because it had um, very few parameters. H3+, plus gives a very nice picture. You get this nice two-dimensional plot. So the very beginning of the, the talk, um, the very beginning of the talk, there was a really nice plot that I really like. Um, and so hopefully now we can appreciate it. Yes. This one here. It's a very nice plot. You have theta one, you have theta two. Um, for those of you who do things like VQE and QAOA, and you look at these uh, optimization surfaces uh, with values of theta, uh, thinking about how you might parameterize a set of unitaries, typically in most um, variational ansatze, what you end up doing is actually multiplying unitary parameterized by one uh, with one value of theta by another unitary parameterized by a different value of theta. In this case, because all the parameters of theta are showing up in the Hamiltonian, we actually get a nice periodicity to it. Right? So this is actually, we actually did a little bit of analysis of what the periodicity is, but every two pi, I believe it, it repeats, right? The entire thing is just is, uh, is, is repeated just because you get this nice circular symmetry from the fact that you're implementing this inside the Hamiltonian level rather than at the, uh, rather than at the, uh, at, the uh, at the level of a product. Uh, product formula. So this is the actual formula. This is the actual surface for H3 plus. It's H3 plus, which means that there, uh, in the minimal basis means that there's three orbitals, two of which are occupied. Because there's two occupied orbitals and one occupied orbital, then I have two mixing parameters. I can rotate from the first occupied orbital to the virtual space or from the second occupied orbital to the virtual orbital. There's only one virtual orbital. So we get these nice 2D plots that we can really look at, appreciate, and kind of wow over, and it looks really nice. Um, so that's, that's really what we did. Uh, let's see if I can skip back. Oh, yeah, it's not actually LaTeX. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm about finished. We have about two minutes left in the questions. Uh, yes. Sorry. Okay, this is HES three. Okay. Um, yes. So the proposed implementation of Hartree Fock does not provide any quantum optimization for the optimization problem. The optimization problem is still just as hard as it would have been if you'd done it classically. And in fact, the way that you're actually optimizing is with the classical algorithm, right? So in many ways, it's not really clear where the quantum resources are actually helping. Uh, the future work wants to use these toy systems and these um, uh, 
Hartree Fock energy surfaces to characterize and classify the landscapes, as I just mentioned. And this is the first step to understanding the computation boundary to quantum classical, right? And the real question is do we expect quantum computers to perform ground state optimization any better than conventional methods? It's not clear to me that you should, right? I don't think that quantum computers are necessarily going to do better for ground state problems. It may in the end, okay, maybe you find that just when we have quantum computers everywhere, you just find a better quantum algorithm just from running um, enough trials. However, quantum computers are known to be able to do time evolution efficiently. This is what they're really for, doing time evolution efficiently. But time evolution does not give you the ground state, right? It can, but only um, only if you're lucky in many ways. Okay, it's the wrong talk. Okay, yes, all right, summary, questions. Um, so finally, I want to say that quantum problems come in two varieties, dynamics, which is a BQP, so you just get a quantum wave function involving in time, that's great, you can do that with the quantum computer without too much fuss. I mean, you have to be precise about which method you're using for doing quantum simulation, you have to be precise about which noise, how much noise, how do you get the output, how are you getting read readout, a lot of things that are details that matter, but at the end of the day, doing quantum dynamics is what you expect a quantum computer to do if you've actually built the quantum computer. Minimization, on the other hand, is QMA hard, which means that even if we built the biggest quantum computer in the world, there's no reason to expect that we can do optimization using that quantum computer. Just like with the class computer, we can't necessarily do optimization just because we have supercomputers. Right? It still could be a very large search base. Optimization is not in BQP. So BQP also does not include um, all MP complete problems. For MP complete problems, you only get a quadratic speed up. This is Grover's um, algorithm. And many, 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 many different uh, generalizations of it. Um, and then there's a question of approval difference between problems, problem instances in P and problem instances in BQP for optimization. Um, classical computers have been around for a long time, and the algorithms for doing electronic structure have been around even longer. Um, I believe Hartree Fock, his father, uh, so Hartree, Douglas Hartree, his father was an engineer. When he first was doing Hartree Fock calculations, his father would do the actual computation, right? So one of the papers, one of the early papers, he thanks a computer, but it's a person, right? I think it was the, the Royal Naval Academy. They just had people who be out alone to do some calculations for you while they're computing the whatever tables that they're doing. So in any case, Hartree Fock is an incomplete problem, so there's not much hope for doing quantum things with it. Um, there might be some clever things, but I don't know what they are yet. Um, other, I mean, I think benchmarking a quantum system is fine, but I don't think that it really gives a speed up for the goal of solving Hartree Fock. Um, and we just played around with some toy models to, to begin our work on landscape analysis, with the idea of being able to uh, approach bigger and bigger problems. So I just want to end by saying thank you for the invitation. Uh, like I said, I, I've been to the Pacific Northwest um, before. It's a wonderful place, you know, as long as it's not raining, right? Um, but yeah, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, we have funders, we have, uh, co uh, we have companies, we have quantum information science at Dartmouth, there's PhD programs and uh, hiring postdocs. You want to work at Dartmouth uh, virtually or however you want to work, <laughs> I guess. Um, but yes, thank you to, to, to again for inviting me. Um, James, there are a few questions out here. I thought. Um, Great. I like um, questions. Can you see? Thank them? you, James. Uh, Hold on a second. Yeah, let me uh, let me ask them in a different order. First, uh, James, thank you uh, for the wonderful talk and also the intuition you provided for various steps from the uh, violin analogy and also the characterization of the methods that you had in the flowchart. Uh, uh, let me. There are several questions. Let me ask them Great. in a, a slightly different order. So first, uh, why are we interested in the hartree fock method on quantum computer instead of uh, unitary coupled cluster, which provides more accurate computations for molecules? Ah, that's a good question. So um, the unitary coupled cluster is probably a better, it's a better onsets for sure. I think the, the reason for being interested in hartree fock um, on a quantum computer is that hartree fock is a fundamental algorithm for what a lot of people do. So when you talk about even UCC, the classical version of UCC is just a CC, it's a couple cluster. This couple cluster method, actually to start the couple cluster method, you need the hartree fock solution. When we're doing this paper, is quite interesting. Um, Sahil works with um, Anna Krylov. And in one of the papers that they had, going back quite far, 
um, there was a problem because they were running a um, couple cluster over top of this, uh, over top of Hartree Fock. You get your Hartree Fock wave function and you run a couple cluster over it. Now, if your Hartree Fock didn't converge and you run a couple cluster over it, well, you're not going to get back a very good couple cluster onsets, right? Even when you start doing things like UCC, you're still perturbing from a Hartree Fock state. So I think that. The idea of Hartree Fock and the methodology of Hartree Fock is extremely fundamental to most of electronic structure. When we talk about where do you begin electronic structure for quantum chemistry, it's almost always from a Hartree Fock uh, product state. Um, UCC will converge much faster if you start from a Hartree Fock state, I would expect, uh, but I, I don't want to say that too strongly uh, in case I'm wrong. But thank you. Uh, so uh, the next question regarding your. Uh, a statement on the non usefulness of quantum computers for ground state calculations. Do you think uh, quantum computations can provide better accuracy if not very good speed up? For example, can it provide better results for multi configurational ground state like multi reference problems? Yeah, so a quantum computer, um, so getting a ground state that's a multi reference problem, that's a good question. So, um, that's actually a very good question. I think that that might actually be a place that you might be able to use a quantum computer better. But even in that instance, it's not clear that um, it'll be efficient to find the ground state, right? So it may be just a typical optimization problem, even in the case of uh, a multi-reference. Um, even if you have multi-reference system, right? The system itself is multi-reference. Does not mean that Hartree Fock is not well defined. Hartree Fock is still well defined as an approximation for any system. It may be a very bad approximation. But uh, what we're talking about, at least my focus here inside this talk, has been about the computational complexity of solving Hartree Fock at all. Right? So it's not saying whether it's a good approximation or a bad approximation. It's just saying, can you even get the right approximation under the Hartree? Can you get the right wave function on the Hartree Fock approximation at all? Right? So this is a separate question for whether it's a good physical approximation. Um, but yeah, I, 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 even for ground states, even for multi-reference systems, it's not clear that quantum computers will be better. It's not clear that they won't, right? You might have a better onsets, and these better onsets might help you do the minimization faster or easier, but that's not necessarily clear that the minimization is going to be fundamentally easy, right? I think this is where landscape analysis would be really helpful to think about what the landscape generated is and whether there's quantum algorithms that can help you navigate that type of landscape. Awesome, thank you. So staying on uh, this uh, topic, um, so yeah, can I say one thing? Yeah, if, I, sure, go ahead. To repose the question, feel free to, to ask it again. But yeah. Yeah. But no. Well, th this was good. Uh, I think that you clearly answered the uh, the question, so we are good there. So I'm just wondering about uh, uh, another related question before going on to other questions in the list. So if you think about quantum phase estimation, right, so that gives you essentially an answer to the full CA problem, except again you need a good initial solution. It's again perturbing a Hartree Fock solution, right? So given that Hartree Fock is so difficult, both it's foundational and it's difficult, are we basically stuck in trying to use quantum computers even when you know, if you had a good solution, we could get you the exact solution, but getting the good solution is the hard part. So what is your uh, thought process or intuition on how we go about doing this? You had this flow chart, but I'm just trying to get that into the context of the full workflow. I mean, I'm really glad this person asked this question because they articulate exactly what I was trying to get across, that um, if you're doing um, optimization problems. So if you want to use dynamics to get out something about the ground state, you're going to need to prepare the initial state anyways, right? So the entire Merlin author game is that Merlin is that author can run phase estimation. Phase estimation is efficient algorithm. Phase estimation is a PQP. The problem is getting initial state is the QMA hard part of the BQP protocol. That Merlin, quantum Merlin has to give the ground state so that author can check that this ground state actually is below this cutoff energy, above that cutoff energy, and can say yes or no. Um, I think the the, the askers, the, the the person who posed the question, has a very good insight as to what my pause is about quantum technology in the first place, right? I think that um, there's no problem talking about doing dynamics, right? Dynamics of quantum systems is extremely interesting. It's also very hard, right? When you talk about what quantum computers, what classical computers are used for, what classical quantum chemistry is used for, it's almost all ground states, right? You get very little about time time dependent dynamics. You have TDDFT, and then you stop talking about it, right? You can name me five methods about ground states that are widely used, widely adopted, and give you three different places implemented, right? I can implement a version of Hartree Vakri this afternoon, right? Well, maybe not this afternoon, it's a bit late in the day, but in any case, Hartree Fox is very easy to implement because it's been implemented so many times. However, doing time dependent dynamics has not. I think this is where things are going to get really interesting. When you do 
time dependent dynamics, any almost every quantum wave function revolving under Hamiltonian that's non trivial will generate entanglement in time. As you generate more and more entanglement, this makes it more and more difficult to simulate classically, at least using our state of the art tensor net network methods. So really the question is what to do with the quantum computer is probably not finding ground states, right? I mean, maybe, I mean, it's not that we should give up on trying to, to do this, right? Solving ground states has been QMA hard for classical computers as well. So the fact that we can get away with it with classical computers means that we might also be able to get away with it with quantum computers. Um, but yeah, as I said, I think that the better method, the better place to focus is on dynamics because we can get a lot more out of spectroscopy and things like that. Thank you, that helps. So now let's let's switch the context to a slightly different question. So uh, one uh, in, in the same theme, but uh, in, in a different question is on are there ways in which quantum resources can help improve the construction of uh, exchange correlation functionals for DFT? You briefly touched upon DFT. Uh, I just want to dig a bit deeper into this. That's a good question. Um, so getting the exact exchange correlation functional is also QMA hard, right? So as you might imagine, because then we give you the access to the ground state energy. Um, there's a few ideas that I have, but I don't have anything concrete. I don't have anything I want to talk about publicly, but if you want to talk about it privately, I could give you a few things that people have thought about. There's a couple of papers about how to generate functionals, uh, but it was a very restricted type of functional from some company out of the UK. I don't remember the, the exact, but I, I, I would say that I would expect not, right? Finding the exact exchange correlation functional is also QMA hard. Now, it may be interesting that you could find, uh, that you could parameterize some functional that you could evaluate with the quantum computer, right? Because with the quantum computer, maybe you could, uh, no, it's not, it's not clear to me how, how uh, but it might be possible. So I, I don't have a good answer. So I would say, I don't know. I think that's the best answer for that. I think it's an interesting question though. Uh, okay. A very interesting question. Uh, the next question we have, uh, Poses that David Wales has a very interesting landscape characterization method or landscape characterization methods for complex polymer packing systems. I wonder if they could be useful here. What's it, David Wales? W A L E S? Correct, yeah. Uh, sounds good. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not aware we'll of this. Immediately period. after this, right? Um, what was the rest of the, the talk? So the rest of the question was David Wales has a package for doing landscape analysis in the context of polymers. Yeah, polymer, polymers and packing systems. It's it's along the lines of the chart that you showed on identifying which methods are going to work well and with which problems. So yeah. this question, I believe, is posted in that context. Yes, this is a um, um, this is a something that's not new, right? So polymers, um, protein folding, a lot of things have very natural ways of discussing landscapes. And so landscape analysis is not a new thing. I think it goes back to maybe even the 70s. I just think it it hasn't been applied, at least not widely, inside of electronic structure and inside of quantum computing optimization problems. I think it's a very interesting way to take something that's been done since the 70s, 60s, and just apply it to new areas. And so that's what we're going to try next, right? Now that we have landscapes, we're going to try and see if we can take these ideas of polymer packing, um, ideas of, of just various ways of understanding um, genetic algorithms, you know, optimization algorithms, uh, predator prey models, all these different landscapes that might show up. But how can we take that technology that's already off the shelf and apply it to understanding which optimization methods are going to work when and where and how do we actually estimate? But yeah, thank you. I will I will check out David Wales um, shortly after this. Thank you. Uh, I think that covers all of the questions uh, we have. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Professor James uh, Whitfield uh, again for giving us this wonderful talk. And it is recorded, so hopefully there'll be uh, others that can watch it later. And we will follow up with you on some of the comments you made and uh, suggestions you said that we could talk about things offline. Um, uh, with that, uh, I give you an opportunity to close. Would you like to give any parting comments, thoughts, pitches? Uh sure thank you all for coming glad to see some people i'm glad to get questions i like it when people interact so um thank you all i hopefully this was a, a good place to learn something at least see something that you've seen or see it in a different way um yeah thanks again for the invitation that's what i'd like to end on thank you with that uh, let's uh, close the session all right